a man ran up, knelt down before him, and asked him, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answered him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. He replied and said to him, Teacher, all of these I have observed from my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You are lacking in one thing. Go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At that statement, his face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. So Jesus again said to them in reply, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were exceedingly astonished and said among themselves, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For men it is impossible, but not for God. All things are possible for God. Verbum Domini the opening antiphon of the Mass, we prayed, we sang, that God delights in us. He doesn't just simply like us, but He delights. He delights in us, His children. That's simply not just liking or putting up with but God actually delights in you. Think about the way a father or a mother looks at a newborn child. The first time their eyes meet, the way they delight in their child, that's only a, a glimmer of how God looks at us. And you know that connection between mother and child in a way you can say is the most profound thing this side of heaven. That connection, that attunement between father, mother, and child. That delight. And that's how God delights in you and in me. Today in the United States of America, we celebrate a national holiday, Memorial Day. It's a day when we honor and remember the lives of those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice in giving their lives in service of protection of our country's freedom. As Christians, it's a duty to pray for the blessed repose of the souls of our fallen brave. One source recorded over 1.1 million Americans have died in service of their country. Our prayers and our gratitude go out not only for them, but also to their families and their friends. The pain of our fellow Americans losing a loved one through war must never be forgotten. Pray today for those who have died 
and for their families who mourn their loss. Let us also keep in mind that there are two tragic wars taking place in our world today, primarily in the Gaza Strip and in Ukraine. And please pray in this Holy Mass for the blessed repose of all who have died and for consolation for their families, grieving the loss and separation of loved ones. It's an obligation to pray for peace. It's a duty in the Christian life to pray for a peaceful resolution to an end to all war. May the Holy Spirit, the counselor, the advocate, guide those around the world who have influence. Pope St. Paul VI, whose memorial is on Wednesday, May 29th, said in 1969 on the celebration for the Day of Peace, the world cannot give up its dream of universal peace. It is precisely because peace is always coming to be, always incomplete, always fragile, always under attack, always difficult, that we proclaim it. We proclaim it as a duty, an inescapable duty. It's an obligation to pray, to sacrifice for peace, to beg God for peace. Yesterday's solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity marks our Christian identity. It's who we are as Christians. Our God has revealed himself. He has told us who he is. Our God doesn't keep us guessing who he is. His revelation is complete. God the Son our Lord Jesus Christ has revealed the plan for salvation in himself. Liberation from sin is only part of the plan. Salvation means much more than liberation. Adoption. We are made his sons and daughters. We are brought into his family. You might say we are restored. God repairs creation. It's been said that God's repair is better than his creation. We sing in Easter, O happy fault, which merited for us so great a redeemer. His restoration is even greater than creation. St. Peter's epistle says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy gave us a new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by the power of God are safeguarded through faith to a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the final time. An inheritance. That word may bring up within you fear and even anger. It's sad what takes place this side of heaven when families deal with inheritance. It breaks apart families. It fractures families. That's not the way it's supposed to be. The inheritance that God gives us is an eternal inheritance an inheritance that can never be taken away from us. Our dignity is given to us by our Creator. 
Again, salvation is so much more than liberation. It's adoption into God's family. Into a family that is meant to heal and to restore creation. To restore the fall, the effects of the fall even. We are made sons and daughters in the family of God. Our inheritance is not material. It's greater than anything we can put into the bank and store away. It's our deepest identity as Christians. Again, our inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for you. The gospel account of the rich young man goes straight to the marrow of the gospel. The question that he asked Jesus perhaps was one of the most fundamental and important questions any of us can ever ask. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Pope St. John Paul II says, quote, it is an essential and unavoidable question of the life for every man. For it is about the moral good that must be done and about eternal life. The young man senses that the connection between the moral good and the fulfillment of his eternal destiny. As with most questions the Lord Jesus presented, he answers with another question. Why do you ask about the good? Our Lord was seeking a deeper motivation, not just about keeping the commandments. He was seeking something deeper. And he's always wanting to go deeper with you and me, not just surface level, not just keeping the commandments. What is our motivation? What is behind it? Ultimately, why are we doing these things? The gospel passage is about what matters most in life and in eternity. The young man comes back with a question after the Lord answering him his question about keeping the commandments. The young man says, what do I still lack? I've done all these things. I've done these things. I've not stolen, I've not committed adultery. What do I still lack? Perhaps this young man knew deep down that simply doing good, keeping the moral precepts, was not good enough. There was something more. There's always something more. He was searching for that final piece of the puzzle that was missing in his life. And it was right in front of him. Jesus. St. John Paul II continues, In the rich young man, whom Matthew's gospel does not name, we can recognize every person, you and me, who consciously or not approaches Christ the Redeemer and questions him about morality. For the young man, the question is not so much about the rules to be followed, but about the full meaning of life. This is, in fact, the aspiration at the heart of every decision and action, the quiet searching and interior prompting which sets freedom in motion. This question is ultimately an appeal to the absolute good which attracts us and beckons us. It is an echo of a call from God who is the origin and goal of man's life. Our Lord answered the young man's question about the good that must be done. 
And then he presents the young man with what will fulfill his desire. If you wish to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Follow me. Christianity is not simply a list of rules or a checklist of goods, deeds to be done, even if done out of love for the Lord. It is a way of life. Our Lord is guiding this young man to what will fulfill him. The good is not simply a list of commandments. Our Lord is presenting himself as the good as a challenge to adhere to him and to follow him, to obey him, to listen to him. And he gives us that promise, that eternal inheritance. Our beloved mother Angelica fell in love with a person, Jesus, and she followed him. Not simply a list of commandments, not simply a list of you should not do this and should, you should not do this and that. Sometimes it begins that way, right? With parents telling your children not to do certain things. Don't do this because of that, because of that. But it can't just end there. There's a reason why we teach children not to do certain things. Not to put things in the electric socket because they're going to get shocked. They might get killed. There's a reason why we set parents set boundaries and say no, not no to this and no to that. But it can't just end there. What needs to be taught is the meaning behind it. Why? What will fulfill? Again, the Holy Trinity, the solemnity of the Holy Trinity yesterday the feast day presents us with our identity who we are every time we trace the sign of the cross we profess our identity we come into mass we dip our hands in holy water in the sign of the cross we profess our identity one of the deepest things that I remember in my life from my younger life is my grandfather making the sign of the cross all day long. And he did it with the most intention that I've ever seen anybody do it. He believed. He was a believer. See how the faith can be passed on from one family to another, from one parent, grandparent to another. The Lord is asking us what we truly believe. What is our true identity? And what is our real inheritance? 